Welcome to the RPTM Podcast, the show that breaks down the myths of monolithic history and tells our story through multiple lenses. I'm your host, Professor Ryan Lancaster. Today's episode is partially underwritten by you, the listener. Find out ways to support the podcast on the website, ryanglancaster.com. Episode 33, Amistad, Sports, and Fitness. Pseudo-history lacks peer review and goes directly to the public, avoiding historical scrutiny. Peer review history means that a historical entry will be read and evaluated by scholars with expertise in the period, subject matter, languages, and documents the author deals with. As peers of the author in a specialized field, these reviewers analyze the review boards of agencies on the scholarly significance of the article. Does the author display knowledge of existing work in the area? Does the research design, processes, methodologies, for example, conform with professional standards? Does the author advance an original argument and provide valid evidence to support the work? Suppose particular areas are weak or absent in the presentation. In that case, the peer reviewers suggest revisions that strengthen the project and call for resubmission before funding is awarded or a manuscript is accepted for publication. Researchers have peer-reviewed manuscripts before publishing them in a variety of ways since the 18th century. The main goal of this practice is to improve the relevance and accuracy of historical discussion. Peer review is not a flawless process. Specific journals are accused of not carrying out stringent peer reviews to expand their customer base more easily, particularly in journals where authors pay a fee before publication. Since the exams and other tests that people pass on their way from layman to expert focus on answering the question in time in accordance with the list of answers and not on making precise distinctions, there is as much individual variation in the ability to distinguish causation from correlation among experts and there is among laymen. Occasionally, however, peer review approves studies that are later wrong and rarely deceptive or fraudulent results are discovered before publication. At times, peer review has been exposed as a process that historical research is orchestrated for a preconceived outcome. Another problem that peer review fails to catch is ghostwriting, a process by which companies draft articles for academics who then publish them in journals, sometimes with little or no charges. Peer review is often considered an integral to the historical discourse in one form or another. Shortcomings of peer review have been met with calls for even more vital filtering and more gatekeeping. Quality research, even some of the most fundamental historical discoveries, date back centuries, long before peer review took its current form. In addition to concerns about the quality of work produced by well-meaning researchers, there are concerns that a truly open system would allow the literature to be populated with junk and propaganda by those with a vested interest in particular issues. The interposition of editors and reviewers between authors and readers may enable the immediates to act as gatekeepers. Criticisms of traditional anonymous peer review allege that it lacks accountability, can lead to abuse by reviewers, and may be biased and inconsistent. There have also been suggestions of gender bias in peer review, with male authors likely receiving more favorable treatment. Some critics of Open access journals have argued that open access journals might utilize substandard or less formal peer review practices compared to traditional subscription journals. Consequently, the quality of scientific work in such journals will suffer. Peer review fails when a peer reviewed article contains fundamental errors that undermine at least one of its main conclusions, which more careful reviewers could have identified. There have been instances where peer reviews was claimed to be performed, but was not. The Amistad In 1839, the captives who carried out the Amistad mutiny had no idea it would become the most famous slave ship rebellion in American history. Taken from Western Africa and shipped across the Atlantic to be sold to the highest bidder, they wanted only to regain their freedom and return to their homes. But their efforts to hijack the Amistad were only the beginning of their extraordinary story. 
Facing unfathomable odds, the rebels gained freedom after a court case that marshaled the full energy of the American abolitionist movement, pit a former president against a sitting one, and called on the Supreme Court to make a final determination. Theirs was an unlikely escape from bondage. From the 16th to the 19th centuries, an estimated 12 million Africans were forcibly shipped across the Atlantic Ocean to the New World in the transatlantic slave trade. Of those, at least 1.5 million are believed to have perished before even reaching shore, done in by the horrid conditions on board slave ships. By the time of the Amistad Rebellion, the United States and all other major slave destinations in North and South America had abolished the importation of enslaved people. Yet since slavery itself remained legal in most of those places, unlawful activities abounded. Along the coast of present-day Sierra Leone, for example, Spanish slave trader Pedro Blanco, said to live partly like a European aristocrat and partly like an African king, continued doing brisk business with the help of an influential local leader who rounded up his human cargo. In February and March of 1839, the 53 Africans who would later find themselves on the Amistad arrived at Blanco's slave depot, known as Lombok, after being arduously marched from Sierra Leone's interior. Most of them had essentially been kidnapped, whereas others had been captured in warfare, taken as debt repayment, or punished for such crimes as adultery. Kept in barracks, they were stripped naked and thoroughly inspected from head to toe. Disease, famine, and beatings were purportedly commonplace. Then, after several weeks, they and 500 or so other captives were loaded onto the Tecora, a Brazilian or Portuguese slave ship. According to testimony that the Amistad captives gave later, they were shackled around the ankles, wrists, and neck and forced to sleep tightly together in contorted positions, with not enough headroom to stand up straight. Whippings were handed out for even minor offenses, like not finishing breakfast, and each morning dead bodies were brought up from the lower deck and tossed into the ocean. Following two months at sea, the Tecora landed in Havana, Cuba, then a Spanish colony, where potential buyers once again poked and prodded the surviving captives like livestock. Undeterred by the illegality of the transactions, José Ruiz purchased 49 adults, and Pedro Montes purchased four children, with plans to bring them to sugar plantations a few hundred miles away in Puerto Principe, Cuba. Ruiz and Montes, both Spaniards, then loaded the enslaved people onto the Amistad, which ironically means friendship in Spanish. On June 28, the Amistad left Havana under cover of nightfall to best avoid British anti-slavery patrols. On board, the captives continued suffering severe mistreatment, including the pouring of salt, rum, and gunpowder into freshly inflicted wounds. In addition, they developed a particular dislike for the cook, who delighted in insinuating that they would all be killed, chopped up, and eaten. Despite being from at least nine different ethnic groups, the Africans agreed to band together in revolt one night. Before dawn on July 2, they either broke or picked the locks on their chains. Led by Joseph Sink they then climbed up to the main deck, headed straight for the cook, and bludgeoned him to death in his sleep. Though awakened by the tumult, the other four crew members, plus Ruiz and Montez, didn't have time to load their guns. Grabbing a dagger and a club, the captain managed to kill one African and mortally wound another. But he was eventually slashed to death with cane knives the Africans had found in the ship's hold. Two other crew members threw a canoe overboard and jumped into the water after it, whereas the cabin boy stayed out of the fighting altogether. Ruiz and Montez, meanwhile, were relieved of their weapons, tied up, and ordered to sail back to Sierra Leone. Having all grown up away from the ocean, the Africans depended on Ruiz and Montez for navigation. During the day, the two Spaniards set an eastward course, as they had been told to do. At night, however, they headed north and west in the hope of being rescued. After passing through the Bahamas, where the Amistad stopped on various small islands, it moved up the United States coast. News reports began to appear of a mysterious schooner, with an all-black crew and tattered sails, steering erratically. With little to drink on board, dehydration and dysentery took a toll, and several Africans died. Finally, on August 26, a Navy brig ran into the Amistad off the eastern end of Long Island. Ruiz and Montez were freed at once, while the Africans were imprisoned in Connecticut, which, unlike New York, was still a slave state at the time. As the Africans languished in poorly ventilated jail cells, thousands of curious visitors paid an admission fee to come to look at them. 
media coverage was extensive, and by early September, a New York City theater was already putting on a play titled The Long, Low Black Schooner. In addition, influential abolitionists helped secure the Africans a trial in a Hartford, Connecticut, federal district court. They faced a formidable suite of opponents. The naval officers who captured the Amistad claimed salvage rights to both the vessel and its human cargo, as did two hunters who had come across some of the Africans looking for water along the Long Island shoreline. Ruiz and Montez likewise wanted their so-called property back, whereas the Spanish and U.S. governments requested that the Africans be returned to Cuba, where near certain death awaited them. Believing the court would take his side, President Martin Van Buren sent a Navy ship to pick up the Africans and transport them away before the abolitionists could appeal. Much to Van Buren's chagrin, however, the Hartford Court ruled in January 1840 that the Africans had been illegally brought to Cuba and that they, therefore, were not enslaved people. The Van Buren administration immediately appealed to a circuit court and then to the Supreme Court, basing its argument on a treaty between Spain and the United States that contained anti-piracy provisions. By then, the plight of the Africans had attracted former President John Quincy Adams, who offered his legal services and defended their right to pursue freedom. Nicknamed Old Man Eloquent, Adams accused Van Buren of abusing his executive power and dramatically gestured to a courtroom copy of the Declaration of Independence to get his point across. Finally, in March 1841, the Supreme Court agreed with him, upholding the lower court in a 7-1 decision. Thus, after over 18 months of incarceration in the United States, the Africans were finally free, not to mention the enslaved time. To make matters even better, they learned that the British had destroyed Blanco's Lombok slave depot in a surprise raid. In its decision, the Supreme Court cleared the government of any repatriation duties, and new President John Tyler declined to provide funds of his own accord. As a result, salvage rights went to the naval officers, not to the Africans. As a result, abolitionists were forced to raise money from scratch for the journey back to Sierra Leone. When an African subsequently drowned in a possible suicide, the number of survivors fell to 35. At last, on November 26, 1841, they and five Christian missionaries boarded a boat, arriving at their destination about seven weeks later. A few of the Amistad rebels stayed with the missionaries, including the four children, who all took English names. But most made a beeline for their families and vanished from the historical record. John, Joel Glanton. As much as we've romanticized the American West for the opportunities it symbolized, the frontier was also the backdrop for some of the most horrific and violent stories in American history as one of the most ruthless villains of the Wild West, John Joel Glanton, and his gang terrorized the Apache for cash throughout the 1840s. In the early years of the Mexican Republic, scalps became the basis of a horrible trade for men like John Joel Glanton. Before iconic Western outlaws like Wild Bill Hickok or Buffalo Bill, hardened frontiersmen like John Joel Glanton. Glanton didn't just play the part of cowboy in a roadshow like Hickok, but he lived the life of the depraved frontiersman that Hollywood was all too happy to write out of a John Wayne movie. Glanton was a scalp hunter, roaming the Sonora Desert with a band of murderers for Apache natives to mutilate for money. John Joel Glanton was born the son of poor white farmers in Edgefield, South Carolina, in 1819. At this time, the United States was looking to expand westward. Meanwhile, Glanton was bottle nursing on brutality. After Glanton's father died, the family moved to Arkansas, where his mother remarried a plantation owner. Even before his 16th birthday, Glanton had garnered a reputation for shocking violence and was reportedly already an active outlaw in Tennessee. In 1835, Texas was just settler's land. Positioned in the hinterland between Mexico and the U.S., Texas became contested property. But considering Mexico itself was not yet independent from Spain, the last thing it wanted to deal with was the 60,000 to 70,000 settlers from the north refusing to pay taxes or recognize Mexican authority on Texas land. What ensued was a war for Texas independence, and 16-year-old Glanton joined. He made a name for himself as a scout, which was a hard job that required those who took it to ride fast over great distances while thinking quickly and being resourceful. 
Glanton managed to escape the war largely unharmed. He spent the next few years between Louisiana, Arkansas, and San Antonio, where he joined John C. Hayes' company of Texas Rangers. Glanton was engaged around this time, but his fiancée was allegedly kidnapped and scalped by Apache natives. Glanton would eventually remarry and have a son. Meanwhile, Mexico simmered at the defiance of Texians, as they were then called. In 1846, the United States, which was hungry for conquest, declared war on Mexico. Glanton soon enlisted as a lieutenant in the Texas Mounted Rifle Volunteers, a counter-guerrilla regiment in the conflict. The northern Mexican states of Sonora, Chihuahua, and Coahuila had long struggled with attacks by the Apaches, a group of Native American tribes who raided settlers as a means of income and reacted explosively when Spanish, and later Mexican, forces attacked them and settled on their land. Finally, in 1835, Manuel Escalante E. Arvizu, governor of Sonora, struck upon a novel idea, he would offer a bounty of 100 pesos, roughly $100, for each Apache scalp, brought to his capital at Arisp. The Apaches were too skilled at riding and fighting for the governor's limited military forces to defeat them, so in bloody desperation, he hoped instead to massacre them. The governors of Chihuahua and Coahuila soon followed, offering different rates of descending value for the scalps of Native American men, women, and children. By the time the Mexican-American War ended in 1848, Glanton was out of work. The following year, he left his wife and child to lead a band of gold prospectors from California to Mexico, but when this effort failed, he happened to be in the perfect place to utilize his violent skills in the scalp trade. Glanton had arrived just in time to join the scalp hunting boom in Mexico, which had already attracted a Seminole War party from Florida, and a team of runaway slaves. In short order, the Glanton gang was formed, which included, supposedly, a young soldier named Samuel Chamberlain. The year 1849 proved to be a banner one for the Glanton gang and other scalp hunters. Governors paid out thousands of dollars to scalpers, even matching each other's bounties in gruesome competitions, offering prizes of as much as $1,000 for a single warrior's scalp. The Glanton gang combed the sparse Sonora Desert, attacking every Apache band small enough to massacre, especially on the lookout for defenseless women and children. But the Apaches had no intention of giving in to these scalpers. Apaches rallied together, killing scalpers and evaporating into the landscape, altogether spoiling the profitability of the vile scalp trade. Before long, it seemed scalping had run its course. But Glanton had no intention of giving up, either. Instead, he turned his eye to the scalps of Mexican peasants and other Native Americans. Glanton figured no one could tell an Apache scalp from another Native American or Mexican scalp. Thus the horrible trade picked up again as scalp hunters targeted anyone with brown skin and dark hair. In 1849, the state of Chihuahua alone paid out $17,896, or $601,210 by 2020 standard, in bounties. But when Mexican authorities realized that Glanton was taking Mexican scalps, Governor Angel Trias Alvarez of Chihuahua placed a bounty of $268,756 by today's standard on Glanton's scalp. Fleeing as fast as he could with his remaining men, Glanton made his way to Sonora, but he quickly wore out his welcome there, and he and his gang had to escape north into Arizona. Reaching the Colorado River that marked the border between Sonora and Arizona, Glanton discovered a ferry operated by a man named A. L. Lincoln, a relative of Abraham Lincoln, a fellow Mexican-American war veteran, who just made a fortune transporting immigrants across the river on their way to join the California Gold Rush. Dot it was Lincoln's misfortune that his next passenger would be John Glanton. Neighboring Lincoln's ferry was a rival operation run by a group of local Yuma Native Americans. Though Lincoln had agreed to employ six of Glanton's men, the scalp hunter thought the ferry too valuable an asset not to own all to himself. Glanton reportedly chased Lincoln out of business and promptly took up robbing and extorting its passengers, charging as much as ten times the previous fares. Glanton managed to insult their chief, and though the humor were naturally furious, they bided their time. In late April 1850, Glanton and some of his men traveled into San Diego to bank the proceeds of their ferry racket, during which they made sure to murder at least one innocent bystander before traveling back. 
Arriving at their camp in the harsh midday sun, they immediately lay down for a siesta. But even in sleep, there was no escape for Glanton from his violence and greed. The Yuma chief had patiently gathered hundreds of Yuma warriors, and they rushed into Glanton's camp as he and his men slept. The Yuma proceeded to beat, knife, and scalp all the men, Glanton included. President William Henry Harrison President William Henry Harrison died after serving only 32 days in office in 1841. Harrison holds the unfortunate presidential record of shortest term in office. Ironically, the man with the shortest White House tenure delivered the most extended inaugural address in history, which may have been his undoing. This first presidential speech, delivered on a bitterly cold March morning, clocked in at 1 hour and 45 minutes. Harrison went to bed at the end of the inauguration day with a bad cold that soon developed into a fatal case of pneumonia. Some historians have claimed that a case of hepatitis may also have contributed to his demise. Harrison was the last president born as an English subject before the American Revolution. A native of Virginia, he attended college with the intent of studying medicine, but opted to join the army before finishing his degree. President John Adams took note of Harrison's exemplary service in the Indian Wars of the Northwest Territories and, in 1801, appointed him governor of the Northwest Territories, which is now Indiana and Illinois. Harrison later fought in the Battle of the Thames River during the War of 1812. He became a congressman and the ambassador to Columbia before running with John Tyler on the Whig Party ticket in the presidential election of 1840. Much to the horror of the political establishment, Harrison and Tyler campaigned in a vigorous style considered unseemingly in their era. They used Harrison's nickname, Tippecanoe, which he had earned during a brutal Indian war campaign at Tippecanoe Creek, and concocted the campaign slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler. Harrison and Tyler held boisterous rallies during which they handed out free bottles of hard cider housed in little log cabin shaped bottles. Their tactics, however controversial, were successful, and on March 4, 1841, Harrison was sworn in as the ninth president. Upon his death, Harrison left behind a widow, Anna, and three surviving children. His grandson, Benjamin, became the 23rd president of the United States in 1889. Unlike his father, Benjamin Harrison served a full term but lost his re-election bid to Grover Cleveland in 1892. Slave Plantations and Sport On the large slave plantations, the popular male sports were wrestling, boxing, racing, hunting, and fishing. The most popular recreations for women were dancing and singing. Masters typically tolerated the slaves' pastimes if they were ready to work when called upon. The slave children improvised their games. Girls, for example, favored ring dances, accompanied by songs and riddles. In the 18th and 19th centuries, sports among all cultures had similar foundations. African sports, even before slavery, involved many of the fundamental activities that African Americans participated in after their forced trek to America. The roots of traditional African sports included wrestling, jumping, running, ball games, and stick or spear throwing all of which continued their cultural role as slaves from Africa adapted to a life of bondage. In the United States Wrestling in African culture during the early 18th century and preceding the 1700s was not only a popular cultural sport. Still, it was a meaningful celebration of life and a rite of passage. Elders forced young men to wrestle other young boys in the tribe to prove their strength and courage before crossing from boyhood to manhood. Entire ceremonies were based around wrestling, and only the most vital members of African tribes could partake in these competitions and festivals. This was done to prove the strength of a tribe and the individuals who lived within its confines. Wrestling was a prominent spot among Africans because their lives promoted themes of physicality and nature. To them, this sport represented a way of life. Many inland tribes who depended on animal husbandry and growing crops staged wrestling matches as a form of ritual to appease the gods to ensure agricultural success. 
while slaves in the U.S. could be called upon to perform for their owners forms of entertainment, such as singing and dancing, male slaves also had the arduous task of fighting for the masters. Running was, and is still today, a prominent physical aspect of life in Africa. Young men in tribes would tend to livestock in pastures far from their homes, and would often run to the location of their daily chores. The boys would partake in races against one another, highlighting their speed and agility in individual athletic competitions. Because enclosed pastures were not readily utilized, roaming animals and distant fields were central to raising much of the livestock for the African tribes. This required running to be a vital element of play and work, as well to maintain the safety and cultivation of animals. Like wrestling, jumping was another sport that was crucial to African culture regarding the young boy's transition into manhood. Initiation rituals among African tribes include many different forms, depending on the different cultures presented. In high jumping, the ability to leap considerably proved a man's strength and physical capabilities. Physical prominence was an attribute respected by many tribal African communities. Accordingly, jumping symbolized the ability to overcome the natural surroundings, creating importance for this particular activity within the communities. In certain tribes, a young boy's final test before his declaration of manhood required him to jump higher than his height, standing straight up. If the young boy failed to reach his peak during the jump, he would be forced to train longer than the others and was looked down upon. This cultural aspect was vital in many African traditions, as it was composed of traditional symbolism that represented an essential stage of growth amongst the tribe's people. Fights involving bare knuckles were arranged by the slave owners for their physically imposing slaves on the same farm to determine who was the strongest. Those who endure and beat the other enslaved are pitted against champions of the other plantations. And in what is termed battle royale, the enslaved males are put in a ring or circle to beat each other till near death while earning a little reward or none. Early Physical Education in the United States The prevention of illness through exercise and nutrition was an outgrowth of quackery medicine. It was a small step from movements like hydropathy, which advocated the natural healing powers of water, to the idea that fresh air, healthy food, and exercise could benefit. The physical fitness movement in the United States followed the influx of many German immigrants who fled their country due to the 1848 revolution. The campaign began with Frederick Ludwig John, who unified exercise and sport with German history and tradition, and saw a connection between mental and physical health. Charles Fallon led the movement in America, organizing the Round Hill School at Harvard, which stressed rigorous psychological and physical exercise. Training included carefully managed and militaristic calisthenics drills. In the Midwest, the Germans established their first gymnastic institution called the Turnverein in Cincinnati in 1848. Later called the Turners, these groups developed nationally and organized outings of picnics, games, gymnastics, and celebrations of German culture. Within Europe, schools had been an essential medium for spreading fitness to society through physical education programs. However, in the United States, the educational process focused primarily on intellectual matters. Schools concentrated on teaching traditional subjects, including reading, writing, and arithmetic. Physical education remained missing from the public education system for the better part of the 19th century. Despite the relative lack of interest in fitness existing during this era, J.C. Warren and Catherine Beecher made significant contributions to the future of wellness in America. Dr. J.C. Warren, a medical professor at Harvard University, was a major proponent of physical activity. Warren's medical background gave him a clear understanding of the necessity for regular exercise, with his recommendations including practices such as gymnastics and calisthenics. Furthermore, Warren began devising activities for females. Catherine Beecher specifically developed fitness programs to meet the needs of women. Among her many different programs was a system of calisthenics performed to music. Though not formally recognized in name, Beecher's programs of the mid-19th century bear remarkable similarities to modern-day aerobics. Catherine Beecher promoted physical fitness for women. She felt corsets not only made such exercise impossible, but deformed women's bodies. Worst of all, such deformities, she believed, could be passed on to future generations and degrade the race. She campaigned for a curriculum that included calisthenics and produced instructive drawings of appropriate exercises for young men and women. 
Catherine Beecher noted a connection between poor air quality in European slums and the spread of disease. She advocated open fireplaces and improved home ventilation, stating the first and most indispensable requisite for health is pure air, both by day and night. She felt windows should be kept open and bed chambers kept cold to improve disease resistance. She researched cooking and heating stove design and strongly opposed closed furnaces because they remove moisture from the air and could leak poisonous gases. Other advocates for clean air included William Alcott, who wanted to change the architecture of schoolhouses to improve ventilation and add outside playgrounds where students could breathe healthful air. The physical fitness movement dovetailed with the evangelical movement's millennialist message of the need for action to improve the human race. Americans had a special responsibility to fulfill the promise of the revolution and rescue civilization. Many believed the country had degenerated from the era of the great leaders of 1776. The increasing number of tuberculosis cases was evidence of this degeneration. Hence the democratic experiment was doomed to failure without an effort to improve physically. The rejuvenation of Americans as individuals and the country's rebirth were tied together in the millennial dream. Catherine Beecher also advocated improving nutrition. She was an early opponent of gluttony, believing condiments on food stimulated the appetite toward excess. Mustard and hot peppers were particularly bad. The best-known 19th-century health food advocate was Sylvester Graham. His 1837 treatise on bread-making expounded against artificial ingredients in flour and endorsed whole grains. He championed vegetarianism because meat overstimulated the digestive tract, and he believed the optimal diet consisted of bran bread, vegetables, and water. Of course, alcohol, tobacco, coffee, and tea also overstimulated and were virulently opposed by temperance leaders. Russell Trawl, the author of the hydropathic cookbook, even suggested liquor-laced cakes were harmful and condemned most cookbooks for combining spices and producing dyspepsia and constipation. You've been listening to the RPTM Podcast. If you like what you hear, please rate us on whatever platform you're listening on. Join us again next week when we talk about the seen and unseen of U.S. history. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, for more information, check out the show notes on my website. The show was produced by me. Our editor is me. Written and researched by me. Music is Down South by Bliv Beats. I'm Ryan Lancaster, and this was the RPTM Podcast.